This is Stephen Beyer from Unearth Films. This is Eric Stanzi. This is Fred Vogel. This is Krandamit Stake. This is Scott Philip Gergens, director of 29 Needles, and you are experiencing sadistic cinema. Sadistic cinema. Sadistic cinema! This is sadistic cinema. Welcome, everybody, to the sickest, darkest side of the internet. This is Sadistic Cinema. Here, as always, I am your host, David Gibson, and my partner, Stephen Nemeth. Stephen, how are you doing this evening? I am wonderful and optimistic because I have been mainlining White Lightning. Oh, okay. We, yeah, we got to keep I'm you ready. going somehow. I'm ready to go, man. <laughs> well... This is going to be a fun episode, Stephen, because uh, we're bringing back another sadistic cinema alum. And, and I'm not just saying this. This is one of my favorite guys in indie film. Uh, I love following him on Facebook. Um, it, he's, he's just a pleasure. Um, Billy Bloody Bill Pond. Billy, how are you doing this evening? I am great. I'm, uh, I'm not doing the white lightning, but I am freebasing some uh, KFC uh, gravy right now. Well, hey, you got to do what you got to do. Yeah. <laughs> you spice it up yourself. I found it yeah. a little bland. I, I throw some extra pepper. In it. <laughs> you know what? I was tell, I was always talking to people. I don't know how old you guys are, but um, being a kid in the seventies, like everything tasted different. Even KFC, they didn't have biscuits. They just had these little square rolls back then, and you can't get that kind of taste anymore on anything. So it's kind of. I was talking to my dad about that the other day. How I miss the old KFC gravy. <laughs> my parents wouldn't let me eat KFC. Uh, KFC. Listen to my, that's that's my my Charleston coming out there, y'all. Um, I we weren't uh, for some reason there were certain restaurants we didn't eat in. We definitely ate Southern food, but for some reason in the '70s and uh, early '80s, it was probably in the mid to late '80s before I ever ate KFC. Um, you know, so I, I don't remember the evolution of it until that time. But um, the, you know, we we did eat fast food occasionally in the in the the '70s. And stuff. I remember. I don't know. Did you ever have a fast food restaurant called Judy's? It was kind of like Wendy's, but a ripoff. Nope, don't remember that one. Oh, we had a bootleg Wendy's, huh? I never heard yeah, of that. It's, one. A, it's a bootleg Wendy's, and it was the same thing. But you know how Wendy's has the red awning, and you know the mm-hmm. red haired girl. They had the same girl. It was the same art. I mean, they just took the IP and ran with it. <laughs> and instead of a red trim, they did a blue trim. They had like you know frosties, hot dogs, burgers. You know, it was the same menu, and they were across the street from each other. But they got um, sued. I think they closed their doors in '77 or '78. But um, I always ate at Judy's instead of Wendy's. And then after they disappeared, I started eating Wendy's. My wife thought that um, I was making it up, and she actually Googled it and found a story at Judy's. And you know, she stopped calling me a, a liar. Now she always <laughs> believes me when I tell a story. Now it's gonna um, be a, a Netflix show. That's probably Judy's versus Wendy's, yeah. Now, um, for the folks who don't know Billy, um, he, he is the mastermind behind um, one of my favorite indie horror films of the last 10 years. And, and I say that uh, without hyperbole. It's, it's a film I truly love, Circus of the Dead. Um, also, uh, Cowboys of Hell forthcoming. And you just signed on for an anthology. Is that correct, Billy? Mm-hmm. With the uh, the barn guys, Justin Seaman and uh, Zane Hirschberger. Oh, and that, that's cryptids? Cryptids, yes. And uh, I see that your segment is uh, the Capoeira Death Machines. Yeah, Chupacabra. Um, well, they get, they oh, well, I say Capoeira. Capoeira. <laughs> I don't know. That's like little dancing martial arts. Yeah, yeah. That's cool. like the Brazilian. <laughs> Yes, Chupacabra. Holy shit, dude. They could do Capriera against the uh, Chupacabra. <laughs> yeah, now, that, that would be awesome. I would that, watch cryptid, the hell out of that, that cryptid went blood sport on a motherfucker. <laughs> now, is, is that something that um, you're already filming, or what's going on with that? We, you know what's funny is I filmed that um, a couple of years ago, I dare say. But uh, what was funny is, you know, because it was since it's a short, it only took like three weekends. And uh, I wasn't feeling good when I was filming it like i knew something was wrong and sure enough like a week after i you know shut down production is when i found out the cancer and stuff and then everything shut down then oh man yeah um i gotta say man um i am so glad you're recovering and um when i saw the video of you um picking up your um wood burned circus of the dead uh 
guitar body. Yes. You were looking like the Billy I remember. <laughs> the old Billy, yeah. It's really great to, to see you look the Thanks, same. Man. I know the treatment takes a physical toll. The Ooh, it did. Toll. And um, uh, I, I mean, you always had that Billy attitude. I, I think, you know, w- was through it. I, I just kind of, I know I didn't message you a whole lot during that time. I figured you need to take care of you, you know, and uh, it, it's great, you know, seeing you back and energetic and, and looking the way I remember. It is, and, and I'm not the same person. Um, the, the chemo jacked the heart up real bad, and it's down to 28%, and that ain't going to change, they say. Um, now, I could probably stand to lose 100 pounds and feel better, but, uh, you know, why the hell would I want to do that for? But, um, uh, <laughs> yeah, but other than that, my mind's back to where it needed to be, and that was the big thing because it, it took a toll on the uh, the mind, too. Like, I just couldn't even think, and, you know, the body function, even writing my name and stuff, that chemo. I couldn't believe something could be that devastating to you. You know, it was just really weird. It, I felt like it was killing me sometimes. Yeah, and you know the funny thing with it because I I had uh, my dad just went through a lung cancer scare, uh-huh. and um, you know I've seen people were destroyed, and my dad's just walking around like nothing happened. I'm right, like, right. Yeah. You know, yeah. it, it, you know I'm expecting the worst to him, and and he's. He's treated his body like shit. I'm, I'm like, I'm like, Dad, you're in your mid sixties. You know, I'm just happy to have you here because you've done everything to make sure you're dead already. But um, yeah, and I'm like, he treated his body like shit his whole life, and he's and he's has no complications. And it's just right. weird. You can just never tell tell. No, what's you going can't. Uh, I was talking to a buddy, the co-writer uh, of everything I do, Lee Anchor, my lifetime buddy. But uh, hey, we we're wait, talking. Did today I just and, miss his uh, birthday? Yesterday, I think. Or yes, the day. Sir, I yeah. need to send yeah. him a belated birthday. I've, I've been so busy, I thought I saw a thing. So let, let's, I don't know when this episode is airing, but let's, I'm going to wish a happy belated birthday to Lee. Yeah, and he, he deserves a lot of credit, but he doesn't like public spotlights and stuff. But there would be no me without him because he's the only guy allowed to um, tell me something's not good. Like, I'll do things. And I'll send it to him and he'll say it and I'll threaten him or put a knife up to his throat and <laughs> threaten to kill him. And and after a couple of days ago, oh, maybe he was right. So let me relook at that. So even like the Cowboys from Hell is um, I had a really good story and then he threw up something really crazy. And I go, hey, why don't we meet on the middle on that? And sure enough, it worked. And that's the same thing with Circus is I couldn't do it without that guy. But we're talking about that, too. He's had some health problems, too. Um, but we're I just told him, I said, I really feel like life is like Plinko. You know, um, price is right. You don't, there's like a million ways it can go and you just don't know. And you can't know, you know, you could prepare for one thing and then something else will come, you know, it's just, it's just like Plinko. You just kind of don't have a choice. You just, you just gotta, gotta go along with it until you, you see where you land, I suppose. Now, you and, and, and grew up together, didn't you? Uh huh. Up in the uh, Mesquite area. And, um, the first time I met him, we we're doing a uh, haunted house, for the local police explorers. And he was in the police explorers. I've always been a uh, bad seed, so I wouldn't have nothing to do with that stuff. But um, <laughs> uh, but uh, he was one of the police explorers, and he was helping me and this other guy with the haunted house. And after that other guy said, hey, you know, because back then you'd make uh, 40 or $50 doing a haunted house as a teenager. And um, for the whole year, for the whole, you know, month. And, um, but then Lee says, hey, I believe this stuff could be bigger. And I did too. And then we, uh, we just started uh, working together, doing our haunted houses, and just worked our way up until we got this one out in Odessa in '98. He got married after a couple years and said, "You know, I hate to do it to you, Billy, because I know you owe a lot on this building, but I'm gonna have to get out of it." You know, and uh, his wife wanted at the time wanted him out of it and stuff like that. And you know, we we're in the hole when he left, but the next year it was like a little profit, and the next year is a lot profit. And anyway, it just blew up after that. So he had some unfortunate <laughs> time to get out of the business. So. Now let me ask you that because because you know you you've been doing these haunted houses for a long time. Long time. What skills did you get doing that that transferred into you making films? What what helped the most? Um, I mean you you could say a lot of things, and I could be cheesy and say really dumb things, but I guess as a, to me as the director is what I I think of you're like a, a conductor of a symphony or something is, but you're that's what you're trying to do is play with the person's mind and emotions and this and that so that's what you get from a han is you got to do the same thing in a han is okay i'm going to get their attention here i'm going to confuse them get them looking over here and then i'm going to get a scare to go up here behind them here or a pop out thing or something so you just try to coordinate a experience 
for the patron or the victim, so to speak, that's going to go through there to give them a roller coaster of the mind, kind of. Now, now for the technical side of it, how how's it helped you technically with uh, you know either pre-production or or how you manage people? Is has has a lot of that transferred over into film production? Well, it does because mostly in haunts, all you're going to get is like 15, 16 year olds to work with you, and you know how those guys are. So yeah. uh, that takes a lot of patience, and you learn that. But uh, like set design. Learned a lot of that construction. Um, but also, I think, too, is important is handling a problem when it arises. You know, somebody gets falls or snags their, you know, shirt on a nail or something, you know, that kind of stuff. you got to learn how to make things safe, you know, run a safe place. And, uh, you know, even the business stuff is getting insurance and, yeah. you know, promoting it and all that kind of stuff. So, sure, all that stuff has paid off for me tenfold because you see how I promote and stuff like that. It, it was all learned in the early days, you know, with well, the that- fronts. Well, that's one thing I love about uh, Circus of the Dead is the the production design. Um, like inside the the clown's cabin, it's just yes. just chock full of all this unusual and grotesque stuff, and it it doesn't feel feel like you're on a set. It it, it makes you feel like you're right there, and 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 I could see that. You know, because if you go to a good haunt, they have all that, Mm -hmm. you know, they're trying to make you feel like you're an actual place. And that really came through on that film. Well, I'll I'll tell you, here's the biggest thing you'll get from that from me. And both of you guys put this in your pocket and save it for the rest of your life is that if people do a clown movie and they're doing that inside of the clown trailer, 99 times out of 100, they're going to say, hey, my. My grandma's got a bunch of clown figures. Uh, oh, hey, look, let's put this clown thing. Let's put this clown shot glass. Let's put this clown dildo. You know, it's like clowns wouldn't collect clowns. What do they get? No. They are clowns. <laughs> so that's what I say is just quit being cheesy and cliche. Do the opposite. The only reason I did Circus of the Dead was to show I was kind of inspired by Spalding, you know, that, yeah. you know, he's just this dude working in a store selling fried chicken, you know, and I said, what if a you know, it's per somebody who's just happened to their day job happened to be a clown, but you know, they're serial killers and they just still stay in costume when they play along with that thing. That's why it's come up. I wanted to make the anti cheesy clown movie, just like we're going to do with the cowboy stuff too. Well, and, and, you know, that's the difference. Um, I, I, I'm a fan of clown horror movies. Mm-hmm. I, I don't know why it is, but you know, you, I love terrifier. I, mm-hmm. I love, uh, stitches, you know, I love, uh, I'm not a big fan of the movie it, but I love the character in that mm-hmm. film and it, it's something that draws me to it. But the thing about circus of the dead is they're clowns, but, but like you're saying, that's kind of like their day job. It doesn't really define their actions. Let's say like in terrifier, mm-hmm. um, I love Art the Clown, but he's 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 really is a clown. You know? Right, right. <laughs> if you see if you see Art the Clown in public, you better turn and go the other way because there's something grotesquely wrong with him that wouldn't be in the real world. Any of my clowns you'd run into at Walmart standing outside holding a balloon, you'd be thinking, Hey, what's going on today? Are they giving away circus tickets, what's up? And um, so that, that's that's where saw- the real is. I think I saw Mr. Blister at Walmart. He was trying to bum a dollar off me <laughs> yeah. at the corner. He is probably at the glory hose where you run into him at. <laughs> well, he was trying to lure me into an alley. I said, wait, Rusty, is that you? <laughs> <laughs> I see Rusty. Uh, we used to go to lunch every day, but now the corona, we probably catch up a couple times a week. But um, that's we like to just shoot the shit. He was the one shooting the uh, video the other day. We hang out a bunch. Yeah. Um, Mr. Blister is him, except he just doesn't smoke except for sausages. <laughs> well, it was awesome meeting um, Rusty at the screening um, in a, Atlanta um, when you came with the Days of the Dead. You know, he's a sci-fi boy, too. He Only because of Circus of the Dead, he's starting to watch more horror stuff. But he he, would, he grew up a nerd and never watched that. He's pretty sci-fi himself. But now, being in this business, he's met so many people and stuff. He can. He, I think he appreciates horror a lot more now. Well, and I like how the clowns, they all had their distinct personalities. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, Rusty, he's just kind of like laid back. And you, yeah. you don't really even see him kill anybody till well deep into the yeah, movie. Yeah. Like, like I love the part where he's playing the little nudie video game and all this shit's <laughs> yeah. going around. And he's just in his own world. He's not even paying attention. Oh, and uh, Ryan and Noodle Dome and Jumbo, like the, the personalities of, of these guys are just awesome. Yeah, Ryan, you know, Ryan was even in Dollboy, um, so he's been around forever. Uh, I knew he was going to do something with me. Even Jumbo was in the uh, 
fake Circus of the Dead trailer from 2017 or 2007. Jeez. Um, we did a fake trailer for Grindhouse. That's where the whole idea started. And that's where I started putting it together. What would I do if this was an actual movie? Um, but Ryan's childlike abilities, you really see that like when, when Bill's humping that face, the head, you can see him behind there clapping and the facial expressions and stuff. Yeah. It's to me, it's, he's pretty flawless. Um, my goal in the second on part two is he's got a, uh, a talk assist thing where he can type and it talks in a, a woman's voice, you know, like on the computer. So wait till you guys see this. It's got some really funny stuff with him talking in it. This next one. Well, and, and, and what the film he had, Bill Oberst, which we were talking before we yeah, started recording. That guy wasn't no good. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I think he's one of the best actors that we have yeah. in our, in our little community. Um, how, how did it come across? to get him in the film was because it, it seems like you almost wrote the, wrote the role for him. Well, um, I guess probably Facebook, lots of people want to take credit for saying this or saying that, but honestly what it is, is I seen him on a, uh, list of, uh, top 10 indie actors to work with and horror or something. And, you know, these are probably made up lists by, you know, guys that do podcasts or whatever, you know, well, Bill and probably made that list. <laughs> it could be. And, and you know what, if he did, he's genius. Cause it worked. But, uh, <laughs> but then I noticed somebody tagged me and him in a post together. Cause they're donating to a charity. He was donating some signed pictures and I was donating some signed doll boys, DVDs or something. And, uh, on there, I put, I'm just, you know, you know, I was trying to fanboying a little bit saying, I'm just proud to be in a post with, you know, the great Bill Oberst Jr. And, uh, you know, I get a friend request from him at work like clockwork. And two days later, I sent him a message saying, Hey, I got a script. Would you be interested in reading? And he goes, yeah, sure. Send it my way. And, uh, I sent it to him and he called back during lunch one day and I was with Rusty and everybody I had the Hollywood number on it. And, uh, the rest is history there. Yeah. And, the one thing I loved about what you did with the film is you have the best swag game in the business. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I had, I had, you sent us out this package that we opened and it was like Christmas. Um, I had a flood since then. So, so I still have my doll boy uh, yeah. DVD. Um, I lost a lot of the posters. They got, yeah. they got ruined, but the, the, the stuff that you put out for the film was just phenomenal. And I think a lot of directors, could learn a little bit from Billy from his marketing. Does that go I, back? Does that go back to the um the to to uh, the haunts? Is is that something that you kind of cut your teeth on doing that? I would say that what we did every year for the haunt is we tried to produce one really cool poster. Um, so that's where yeah it all started. But then what's happening is we started doing bigger photo shoots, and I go, well let's do one on this, and let's do one on that. So the next thing you know, we're doing four or five photo shoots early October every year. And we even had some old pictures of doll boy and stuff like that. So it did, but I worked in the media. I worked for a TV station and creative services. And, and my buddy was the graphic artist at the time. And now he works for Panini. Now that big card company that used to be Donruss. Okay. Um, yeah. So he's the one that did all that early art and stuff like that. You know, he's still one of my best friends and all that, but um, I try not to bother him as much anymore. Cause I know he's, you know, he gets paid a ton of money to do what he does and I ain't going to pay him jack shit, but um, <laughs> cause he's my friend. See friends and family, you're screwed. I, I'm not doing it. You're going to do it for me. Cause I do for you guys. So that's what I always <laughs> say. But, uh, but uh, no, we learn from there is just being in marketing and working in marketing. And what do you want? I mean, what does it cost to print up a thousand little lobby cards, little postcards, you know, maybe a hundred bucks. I mean, that'll last you forever. You go to these conventions or send out an extra one. Even now, anytime somebody orders something from me, I'll throw in like, I think I'm sending out like 12 or 14 stickers and, you know, assigned postcards and, you know, mini posters, things like that. So whatever. Yeah, I, I need one I, of those. I need one of those garbage pail kids. <laughs> yes. I still got some. <laughs> oh, those, those things look awesome, man. I, um, I, I really love that package you sent us, and that was was that a was five, that a recent one? Or was it five no, no. Well, I mean, you know, you you reached out to me, you sent me the magnet, and um, when uh, I got the 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 self produced uh, Blu Ray, you you definitely oh, okay. put a whole bunch of goodies in there. Good, good, but good. I, I'm talking this about the one. Yeah, yeah. This is 2015, the maybe days. late late 2014. Oh yeah, we I, had the I, doll boy coloring books. Back the the viewfinders. The viewfinders. Viewfinders. Yep, yep. Yep. Yeah. The um, uh, they were what black, right? Yep. Yep. The and they I had the Circus of the Dead sticker on yep. them. Those are really rare. Um, I still, I still have it. Um, I, I do have one complaint though. What's that? And maybe just some feedback. You could use this for your, you know, however you want to take it. 
But those, um, were they Blue Azul? Those things? <laughs> Parallel Azul, those, yeah. Th- those are the most uncomfortable suppositories I've ever used. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you wish they, a they, suppository was that small. They, they would snap inside. <laughs> it hurt like hell. You would fart candy dust. <laughs> This is another thing I loved about the the products in the film, um, you know, like the Tarantino Big Apple, you know, yeah, smoke. Yeah, there's a ton you know, of that stuff. Blue, blue Azul. And, uh, you know, like... Pale, pale Azul, Blue Dog. Blue Dog, yeah. Or, or was it Blue... Is it Blue Dog? Well, it's Pero Azul, which is Blue Pero Dog. Pero Azul. Dog, oh, so I, dog I'm, blue blue, or I'm seeing Blue Blue. Yeah. yeah. I'm sorry. I, I've been drinking some. We're not. We're not talking about your side gig. <laughs> I, I've, been, I've been drinking some bug. That's the blue yeah, oyster yeah. bar. Per, as Pero Azul. Yeah, the blue oyster bar. You you'll see me there nightly. Yeah. With Proctor. There, uh, yeah, I, I'm dressed like Al Pacino in Cruising. <laughs> but um, yeah, you're you're definitely a showman with the uh, the the circus of the dead paraphernalia. You know what you didn't get though? What's that? And I'll tell you why is the uh, the sodas, the clown sodas. Oh, oh man, yeah, yeah. Uh, I, um, I, I tried to send some out to relatives, and out of like, say, if I'd send twelve, like two would make it safe. They'd always open somehow, and I don't know if it was heat. I no matter how good I wrapped them or whatever, they just never would arrive safe. So I just really? couldn't figure out a way to get them to people without them opening and stuff. Oh, that sucks, man. I know. And, and now that company went out of business. So you had, what was it, three flavors? Four flavors for all four, four clowns. Okay, <laughs> sweet. I, I, I was trying to remember. I forgot if it was all of them or if you just had the, the three. But I remember I um I wanted to get out there and see you that weekend. Um, but I, I couldn't make it out of Charleston. So I, I definitely missed out on those uh, when you had them at the, um, that was at that festival, right? Was that Texas? Yeah, Frightmare. Texas Frightmare Weekend. And see, yeah. the reason we did that one is because I could carry the boxes, you know, in my truck up there. Up there so I knew they'd be safer. Yeah, yeah. Now, let the, the, that guitar that you just got. Yes. You know, if anybody's following Billy on Facebook, um, you, ha- you, you had this guitar made with, uh, you know, artwork um, for uh, Circus of the Dead. That thing was absolutely fucking beautiful. Yeah, it turned um, out pretty damn cool. Please, was that was that like a big gift to, to yourself? Um, yeah. The 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 artist of that, the shout out to him was uh, Nathan Milliner. You guys know him, right? And he's yeah. done a lot of stuff too. Um, he drew those years ago. Um, back before I knew him good, I always thought he was a great artist. So I would, anytime he'd say, "Hey, I'm doing fifty dollars sketches tonight. Anybody got anything?" I'd say, "Hey, could you do popcorn?" And I guess it got him interested. He watched the film and called me back. We become pretty good friends on the phone and stuff now. Um, but he did that artwork years ago. Then uh, Sean Smithson, who works at Smithson uh, Creations and woodworking and stuff, is he was posting his stuff for the Romero Indie Brigade, and I said. Um, could you do a guitar? And he goes, I don't know. I go, why don't I send a body and just let's see what happens. And he said, yeah, I think we could do something. And I said, well, let me lay some artwork out and stuff. And I kind of, you know, took a picture of the body and then um, laid it out there on what we did and did a lot of things here and there. And it just couldn't believe it turned out that good. I just can't wait to get it together. It's a, it's an old uh, factory second body from PV of the Wolfgang special. So, th- I mean, if you know anything about the Eddie guitars, he started out with, uh, of course, Kramer and all them back in the day, but um, in the nineties, he switched to music man and started his own model. And then he went to PV. And then about 2004, he went and started his own company. So this is only like, a, these guitars are only made about an eight or nine year window there. And they recently cleaned out the factory and had a bunch of stuff laying around and stuff. And I snagged one of those bodies. So finding the other pieces were kind of tough, but I got everything I need now. Now I just need to get it put together. Now what's, what's a bigger love film or music? If you had to give up one, what would it be? I mean, at this point in life, I'd probably say I'd give up film. Yeah. Yeah. Because I don't have any expectations in music. It's it's not stressful. It's not hurtful. It's not. It doesn't. It doesn't cause me much pain. When I was younger, it did because I couldn't play this or nothing. But now, if I could sit down, I could probably learn anything I want. But mostly, I just enjoy playing with my band and stuff. So it's just it's just no pressure with that. Um, as much as I love film, it's like a um, 
double-edged sword. You know, it, it causes just as much heart heartache and heartbreak. And sometimes I think that's what gave me cancer is making Circus of the Dead. It was just so damn stressful. Yeah. Well, the music, you get that instant um, catharsis. Yeah. You're and it's not just waiting escape. around. Yeah. Yeah. So what is there anything you're jamming with now? Is um, is uh, Wayne Halen, uh, Corn Fed Cadillac? You know, Corn Fed the... Cadillac. We've been writing a bunch of during the the quarantine thing. We've been gathering up there uh, and up at the hot, and I got a jam room up there, and we've been playing some originals and stuff. We need to go record them because we got we're actually pretty getting some pretty good ones. And I don't say any of my stuff is pretty good, but we got some pretty good stuff now. It's a throwback to rock and roll you know anybody under the age of 30 here they'd probably say what kind of garbage is this but you know any of us old dudes with our old balls and stuff like that will really like it a lot <laughs> and put it, and play it in our primer del caminos and turn up the track you know the a track what, what type of rock is it like rycooter or what, what kind of stuff is no it would i would probably say we fall along the lines of i mean of course i mean you know if you hear you'll hear van halen and my stuff but it's just very uh, hard rock and blues if anything Okay, yeah. and is is Billy Hendrix experiment? Is that? It's gone? yeah. It's no. I mean, it's one of those things that comes out once or twice a year. Um, uh, our singers get ready to move to Granbury, so we'll probably be a three piece. The, the reason Billy Hendrix come about anyway is an old band a long time ago. Skull Size was going on. We couldn't keep a singer and a rhythm guitar, so we always were a three piece. So there was a party coming up uh, for an ad club and they're doing like a Woodstock theme. So I said, Hey, let's just do some Hendrix stuff. And, and I was an okay fan of Hendrix, but that turned me into a Uber Hendrix fan after I started, you know, performing and doing his stuff, because that's when I really appreciated it all. What's your favorite Van Halen LP? The album. Um, if I had to just say one, like if I could only take one, if I died, probably the first one. It, it's a damn, damn. Fine. Because I mean, it kind of yeah. just, covers the spectrum i mean yeah. i love 84 some days and, and i even do a lot of fair warning too but it's it kind of just depends the day but if you said i can only take you just you just mentioned my three favorites the, yeah. um i de definitely the first and 84 were my top two but like the older i get the more i like fair warning and mm -hmm. um, did, did you ever hear the uh the demos I've uh, heard everything that's ever existed on Van Halen. Yeah. It'd be really hard for me to stop me on any of that stuff. Um, like they that did that when they were starting to fight with each other. I always heard that was the angry album was Fair Warning. That's why I liked it. It's just the guitar was oh, it's dark. angry on it's that a dark one. album. Yeah. yeah. That um, and, and I was thinking about the demos because I was thinking about the early um, with Gene Simmons fast, and stuff. The faster version of House of Pain. Yes, yes, yes. So, I listen to a lot of bootlegs and especially old oh, yeah. stuff. I love those live recordings. Oh, they're they're great, man. Now this um, Cowboys of Hell, the Cowboys yeah. from Hell. Uh -huh. What um, tell tell the people a little bit about your idea behind that. What, 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 and then maybe like a synopsis from the writing that we wouldn't yeah, be giving yeah. away too much. Well, uh, first off, you got to go with just the title, um, Cowboys from Hell. That's that's my uh, nod to Dimebag. Um, being a Texan, I love that. I love that guy so much. Um, now what we're going to do too, is we're going to, with, with, uh, Sean Smithson and that wood carving is we're going to do some, um, we're going to use those, uh, dime bag guitars, those Dean ML bodies. And I'm going to do old wash ferns. Yeah. Or actually, you know, the Dean's before that. So the Dean's yeah. Yeah. So, uh, we're going to put some really cool Cowboys from hell artwork and probably do about four to six of them to use on our, uh, you know, our fundraising when we do it as perks. Awesome. So that's going to be pretty cool. But uh, basically the movie is about, um, I wrote it, the majority of it when, when I was going through chemo and couldn't get out of bed and stuff. And I had a laptop with me and um, my pencil on my iPad. And it's basically about a guy who um, he's done something. Now everybody loves him and all this kind of stuff, but he's coming to the end of it. And he did something really bad when he was young that he's got a, you know, pay the piper for, and that's what's happening. And, and everybody loves him and stuff now, but when this truth comes out of what he was in this past life, you know, he's, he's basically got to, you know, prove himself worthy, you know, all this, but when he actually just deserves death, but, um, it, it's, it's, it's going to have Brad Potts in it, um, who played the trooper in circus of the dead. Um, this all come about because I met him and he just said, you know, he said he gets stereotyped for things all the time. And I said, 
you know, I just love the way he acts and stuff like that. And I said, well, I bet I can write you a great movie. And that's what this is. So I know he's this Corona and all this stuff. He, we haven't talked in about a month and that's the longest we've gone. Um, but I hope he's not too mad at me. He's just wanting to see that script real bad. And I'm trying to, you know, <laughs> make sure everything's perfect before I send it to him. But uh, Oberst is going to be in it too. Yeah. Tell and me. I see it's, it's listed as horror Western. Yeah. Um, what's the horror is the horror just going to be because because of the violence or is there going to be you know more of a horror trope to it it well you know me i mean i can't do nothing but horror but also i can't do you know everything's dark comedy with me too yeah Um, i'm going to basically take the ideal of a classic western you know spaghetti westerns uh john wayne stuff and then mix it with like the exorcist and evil dead and stuff and those kind of elements it's just i want it to be like aliens you know, kind of thing. It's it's just and something fun and unique that's just hasn't been done yet. You know, like I did with clowns. I I wanna I wanna make a cool movie that I would like to go see and be entertained by. And and it seems to be a strong market for kind of uh, uh, those type of horror films right now. Not only the folk horror, but mm-hmm. also you you are starting to see more uh, western themed. And um, it could be. Uh, I don't like the clown thing. You know, as they go. Uh, Circus of the Dead copy Terrifier. I was thinking, man, I was out <laughs> a year. I've been out for four or five years. Nobody's known, but uh, it's a. Uh, I don't like riding waves, but if I do have to ride a wave, like if I had to make a shark movie, it would be better than the other Sharknado and stuff because I'm not going to make cheese. Um, well, I, and I don't consider it a wave. There's just uh, you know you had um, Bone Tomahawk, which we talk a bit about, which I think was a brilliant film. See, and, and you know, and I I love that director because I love that brawl on Subblock Ninety Nine. But Bone Tomahawk, I did not like. I just get angry about too it. Slow. It was very slow. But what I didn't get was the whole. Um, these guys are supposed to be like inbred monsters, and inside there they had like the chains and keys and handcuffs and poles built in the cave, you know, to like cages and stuff. And it just seemed to be so, why did they have a bone hump tomahawk then? It could have just had a regular one since they were apparently forging metal. I don't know. Yeah. You're not the first one I've heard say and, that. And, and let me, let me play devil's advocate on that one there. They is stole it, it all. <laughs> yeah, is it possible yeah. They got it in raids. Now, you know, how they, how they utilize it. There you go. Yeah. That, Cause it's like, Oh, little, we got these metal. Poles. I don't, I don't have a defense it? for that. You know, maybe they would have impelled people. Here's what I'm saying is like, if if it was me, if you go, well, what would you have done different, Mr. Big Shot Billy? Is what I would do different is I would have made them do like hooks or something through the Achilles tendons or something so a person couldn't escape, you know, or okay. something like that. Something like that. Something more, you know, uh, primitive, so to primitive, speak. Primitive, yeah. Yeah, that's what would make them a little bit more scarier. But, of course, the ending and that cutting that person in half was flawless. Um, but, yes, it was slow. And, and something else, too, is when they're in the town and stuff like that, it just seemed – it's like you said during the circus when you look inside the the clown trailer, there's just something interesting everywhere you look or something. It was really decorated good, and, and I felt like that one is like there was some places where there was nothing on anything. It just felt like, yeah. hey, we showed up, let's shoot. Oh, we got three extra cowboys today. Okay, put them in the background. It just, just it seemed like they just kind of missed the mark a little bit there, and I really like yeah. that director. And um, believe it or not, the editor for that guy – Greg Dioria is is he checked out Circus in the beginning to give me some editing feedback and stuff and oh, um, really? yeah so I've made pretty good friends with him too and stuff like that so it's I got a connection to that director and all and I like him and I hate that about Bone Tomahawk because here's the thing you guys I don't want to hate anything I don't I'm just trying to be honest about things I want to love everything I want everything to be so awesome that it just knocks me off my feet you know yeah so it's not just me saying that or jealous or something um but I saw Bone Tomahawk and and you know that's considered one of the best and stuff. And I seen something recently. Where uh, they went to a the house. wind. There's one that came out last year called The Wind. I was not a big fan of it. I don't think I saw that one. What was the one where they're at the brothel? Western oriented. Yeah, Western. Total total Western. I I don't I don't think I saw that. I just no, I don't think I've seen that one. Recently, it didn't look bad. It's from a movie. A famous guy's son made the movie from a. F- famous producer that did Bubba Hotep. The producer wrote Bubba Hotep. Oh, that guy. Oh, anyway. I I yeah, one. it's not a bad it's not a bad movie. Um and it was pretty good and there's some th- things well done, but they dropped the ball a couple times on a couple of things. And but those are the two I'm looking at too. If I I just tell myself, you beat those two, you're on to something. Well Jason and you know I Sapp? think I, 
I think the Western is is been almost forgotten. I, I'm 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 glad to see some more films set in that era. Um, I really loved what the Coen Brothers did with Buster Scruggs. Uh, it's kind of a divisive film, but I I just really no, loved it. No, they're pretty dark. They use a little too much CGI when, on some of those things. I noticed yeah. they're going to. Um, but like that's what's killing me with these indie westerns. There's a lot of indie westerns, but you guys don't hear about them because they're garbage. Um, but this the whole CGI gunfire. It's like Walking Dead. If you shoot a gun, I don't know if you guys ever shot real guns, but it's gonna move your hand. I don't care yeah. if you're Arnold Schwarzenegger. But these dudes just shoot hundreds of shots. They're wrists don't even flinch it's just somebody yeah. adding in a little cgi gunfire we're not doing any of that we're going old school on that and squibs okay awesome yeah. that's us yeah cgi i they do it for some things i'm like isn't it more expensive than just doing it old not, school not way? these days it isn't because <laughs> here's one thing too though is like when you do like the when we uh i guess blew the back of tiffany's you know, Rose character in the convenience store. That's a one take. That thing makes such a mess that you don't get two takes out of that. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> that's what sucks about real blood and stuff like that is you kind of got one take to get it right. Yeah. And since we got people listening because, you know, we're, we're a horror centric podcast, but we also deal with, you know, nihilistic film and, you know, we just love cinema all around. Um, I'm a big fan of spaghetti, spaghetti Westerns, definitely, but mm -hmm. I'm a big fan of American Westerns, too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And John, John Ford and um, Howard Hawks are, like, some of my favorites. Um, Rio <coughs> Bravo and The Searchers and, um, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Red River. And, and those are some films that are so inspirational to me. Uh, Rio Bravo, just the Technicolor photography in it is incredible. Um, is there any other old favorites you could just drop name drop? So maybe yeah, you could but I think what I would do some people to is you know of course all those, and I would never take anything away from any of those because I grew up cutting my chops on them. But I think if I had to pick one filmmaker, it was from a filmmaker who I don't want to say ripped off of those, but basically was really influenced by them, and that's Walter Hill and the Long oh, Riders. Yeah. Yeah, that's because I saw that as a kid when VHS first come out, and I guess it come out in seventy seven or eighty or something, or I don't know, late seventies, and uh, so I got to see it on VHS, and it just seems so violent and bloody and mean and nasty, and that's that's the one that's kind of always stuck with me, and even that old uh, Paul Newman one, Judge Roy Bean, times mm -hmm. of Judge Roy Bean, things like that. Um, but of course the original True Grit, but like the Coen Brothers boy, they like do that stuff right. Buster yeah. Scruggs, the True Grit. Um, some of these new ones, the Kevin Costner one, I guess, got it right pretty good too. They did a lot of Walter Hill. When somebody'd shoot, they'd get yanked back, you know, twenty feet and stuff like that. I love that kind of stuff. Um, it's just ultra violent. I just that's, I guess, like a Clockwork Orange. I'm just a really ultra violent kind of <laughs> guy. <laughs> Yeah, I think that's that's what keeps me g glued to a western. Um, mm -hmm. I, you know, Stephen's a big fan of the old school stuff. Up, I, I I'm really not, but I'm also a New York boy, so yeah. you know maybe that has something to do with it. But and, they would have I, that. It's like the old west. You go, well, everybody would talk hick. It's like, no, there'd be somebody that was transplanted from New York there. That had oh yeah, thing. yeah. And but I guess what we want to do though is we want to like I love those old ones, but they had ethics and morals and stuff in filmmaking back then. You know what I mean? And and I'm indie at the core and I'm going to push the envelope. So it's not going to be, I mean, it's, it needs to be some, you know, uncircumcised nasty dicks and stuff in there. It needs, <laughs> it needs to be some big giant bushes and heavier set women and some things and stuff. It needs to be like it really was. Yeah. And, and you know, I, 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 I am more into like the spaghetti Westerns and newer just because I like the anti-hero mm -hmm. and, and, and I don't like everything. I, I, don't like the white knight coming in on a stallion right, you know? right. and then uh, the spaghetti westerns is like they're great too with stories and stuff but like their uh, costumes and stuff i always think you know i know it set its own precedent but that's like i'm not a, too much of a fan of the costumes and stuff on that one so um but i do love the stories and the anti-heroes and all that kind of stuff but same thing you know with like the uh the cowboys with john wayne all that stuff inspired me as a kid and stuff like that Oh, that's awesome, man. Now, um, the cryptids, how did, how did that come a, about? Cause obviously you already had the short made. Mm -hmm. Um, Oh it, no, no, it, they, I did it just for them. It's this stuff works on a long time. I'm okay. sure they work on you know, three or four projects or whatever. I just got a, 
they reached out to me and uh, wanted to know if I wanted to be a part of it. And I said, hell yeah. I know it's taken long and all this, and I hope it's good enough uh, when I finish it. I got a couple of little reshoots to do, but um, I'm always worried they're going to say, hey, that sucks, Billy. We're not going to be able to include it. But uh, <laughs> that's probably just my own, uh, what do you call it, lack of self-esteem when it comes to my own work. <laughs> Well, well, all artists have that from from what I <laughs> gathered, and, and and I've never made film. I was more of a music guy growing up, and I always thought I sucked. So I I I, I probably did you need really that. suck, but uh, you know who's the worst on themselves that anybody is Bill, and I tell that guy, I said, buddy, you're great, but he'll never accept being told he's great or anything. He's just not. That's just not who he is. He's not wired like that. What what's the runtime on um your part of cryptids? Um, well, right now it's at 13 cause it's very loose and I haven't edited yeah. it down, but I think it's going to hit to about nine or 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah. Now, now you're talking before we recorded, uh, um, you had a good story about Gunnar Hansen. Yeah. Um, now this is before, this is probably the mid eighties. I remember I was like 15. I didn't have a license and my mom had to take me and Lee out to this, um, convention. I remember going up an elevator or something at a hotel or something and, uh, him and Ed Neal was there, and Ed was even doing an uh, impersonation of the Hitchhiker. Now, looking okay. back on it now, this was like 85, and they did that movie in 73, 74. So you're really only 10 years removed, which you go, that's not very long. Because looking back now, you know, it seems 40, 50 years ago. But um, I didn't understand the significance of what it would mean, but I told him I wanted to make movies and stuff all this day, and they're really open into listening. And um, signed some stuff. He signed a chainsaw, an old school 70s chainsaw for me or something. And um, <laughs> I still have to this day and stuff like that. But, uh, you know, fast forward to uh, Frightmare, I guess about four or five years ago. And I got to meet him and stuff and sit down and talk to him some on a Sunday. It got slow. And, and you know, I know he didn't remember me, you know, but I said, you know, I was a kid and talking to you. And I told you I was going to make these movies and stuff these days and stuff. And I was talking about Dollboy and the experiences and all that. And Dollboy is kind of based on Leatherface a lot. Um so it was just, it was very coming full circle. And, and I wanted to work with him and give him cameos. And we're real close with Marilyn Burns too on Circus of the Dead. But I was embarrassed about the small part I was going to offer her. And yeah. I didn't go forward with it because I thought I wanted to write her something really good in Cowboys from Hell. She was supposed to play the madam in this, in Cowboys from Hell. Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's sad, man. And rest, rest in peace to them. Yeah, yeah. They're, they're dropping off so quick, you guys. And that's there's people probably younger than us that are dropping off, too. It's just you, you don't know what tomorrow holds, you guys. Well, now, I, I, I was, you know, a lot of the older generations, like people in the early films from 30s and 40s and stuff like that, we when we were younger, you know, they were filling up the news with deaths of, of those people because they were definitely at, at the end of ex, at life expectancy, many of them. Mm -hmm. And then... Then it was people that next step or that next wave of filmmaking closer. Then it started to be people that I idolized that I only saw as being a little older than me, you know, or mm -hmm. dying like people who were in their 20s or late 20s when I was a teenager who I bought their records and LPs. Yeah, yeah. You know? And that freaks me out. And then now I'm seeing people my age and, and like you say, younger you know, uh, passing away, um, in succession. And, uh, it, it's, it's not, it's not cool. Um, it reminds me about mortality and very much it, so. it, it's, it's very surreal. And I was feeling that before we had our new normal and COVID and all the, you know, the, the weirdness and, and surreal, um, you know, experiences that go with that. And, and it's, it's just such a strange time these last few years that, you know, and at the same time, I'm knocking stuff off my bucket list. I, I'm, you know, finally worked on a franchise of Japanese extreme horror that I that I loved in the American reboots, and I finally got to do a. Um, I was DP on a um, uh, an action-packed road movie full of car stunts and shootouts and stuff, and um, I, I can't wait to share a trailer with that pretty soon when when that's ready here. It's in post and it's coming up soon, but um, yeah, it's just like. I still feel young, man. I, I still feel like a teenager in, in many ways. I do feel old in some, but as far as like my how, how edgy I feel or, or creative, I, I still feel very potent in that aspect. And um, seeing many people, contemporaries and people just a bit older than me dying is, 
is really weird. And from dying from different things too. Is there's a a friend from Frontmere that uh, that committed suicide I, I, about three weeks ago, and um, oh, wow. it's that kind of stuff. But it's like you know, it's I'm a tortured artist, and I get that, and I've had depression and stuff like that. Um, you know, many girlfriends that you know never worked out to wives. I didn't get married till I was 48, and I just gave up chasing that kind of thing because I didn't think it was my life. You know, until I met my wife. It's kind of like the TV remote, you know, or your keys. You're not going to find them when you're looking for them. You're going to find it when you're not. But yeah. to me, I think the thing that changed it all was that chemo and just feeling like I was fixing to die. Like I really, there was days the wife would leave to uh, go to the sister city or whatever, and I'd be home alone. And I was just scared to saying, I, I just, please don't let her come home and find me dead. Um, but that's what gave me the lust for life now. And I was talking to a, uh, friend the other day that was i guess teetering on the edge of you know wanting to give up and all this kind of stuff and believe it or not you guys you know this happens a lot with people and um i was talking to him and and i was trying to tell him that i said you know i I felt the same way before but i said now i just appreciate the small things you know a good shade tree you know in a comfortable chair or spending time with these grandkids that i inherited or something it's like they knock you know one of my popcorn figures off and break it it's not a big deal anymore things aren't i don't care about the things i used to care about it's it's the little things and the fun times you know with people that you care about is what really matters um and that's what i would tell somebody is like if if times gets dark it is dark but i promise if you just tough it out it's going to get better you just got to hang in there Um, well i was gonna i was gonna ask on cowboys of hell since you wrote that it's such a a difficult time in your life um are we going to see a lot of that in the writing? Is it, is it just going to be super dark or, or do we see more of a, a love for life or, or, or question mortality? How, how did your experience go into your writing? Well, it's, it's not, it's definitely not a lust for life. Um, it is very dark, um, but it's more basically you're just at the end of your road. It's, it's basically what would happen if this was, if this was it, what would you have to say? I mean, you know, Classic Hollywood would say, you're going to go out in a blaze of glory, you know, but it's like, I don't, that's not Billy Pond style. So I have to make it fit in my kind of world kind of thing. It's, it's basically, um, this guy's got, he's got to pay the devil for what he did wrong and, uh, before he can pass off and be happy. So it's not, he's not, Brad's not, or bloody Bill who he plays is not afraid of dying. You know, he wants to die, but they're just not going to allow him to die until he's paid that piper. And, you know, as we get older, that that fear of mortality just, you know, I, I, I always say I'm not, I, I'm not a religious person, so mm-hmm. I I have no idea what's going to happen on that next plane of existence as if there is a plane of existence. And that's what that scares me more than anything. It's also just being away from the people I love and care about and what kind of, you know, what kind of effect my past is going to have on them. And uh, that's that's why I find beauty in art because uh, we're able to escape those anxieties that we have. Um, was writing in any way an escape from what you were dealing with at that moment? Did it help you uh, cathartically? It did, and I, and I wrote two movies um, during that time. The other one is is... Well, working title, Charlie and the Monster Factory. Um, really? <laughs> yeah, and it's it's kind of uh, it'll be it'd be compared to a Monster Squad kind of thing. Um, and that one, I dare say, could you know? I mean, I'm gonna I'm gonna say something that you guys are gonna laugh and fall out of your chairs, but I mean that's I feel like it's Academy Award worthy kind of. It's I don't think it's gonna be the uh, X-rated NC-17 bloody bill. I think it's I'm gonna purposely tailor this one for you know under 13 so I can give these kids you know, a message about dying. Um, I think me growing up is, is me fearing. I had some, a cousin die in a car wreck when I was really young and it stuck with me. And then my sister died in a car wreck, but I've always feared, you know, somebody calling me in the middle of the night because somebody's passed away. I hate that kind of thing. I guess we all yeah. do. Um, so that's what I want this movie is to, cause I'm not religious either. Um, and, and I want something to help somebody, you know, young, you know, cope with this thing called dying. And, and that's what that movie's about. I think in, it's such an underrepresented um, part of horror. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a father, and I have kids. 
I'll tell you, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is one of the most important films ever made, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. I and, agree. And, and my five-year-old son has watched that. Now, a lot of people who don't know horror is like, that's really fucked up. It's, like, it's not really a gory film. There's no uh, gore it's in the film. your imagination nowadays. Yeah, there, there's, no I, nudi- there's no nudity. There's very little profanity. But I wish we had more film that was made at that level where... Mm-hmm. You know, I, a little bit of gore doesn't bother the kids, but something where, you know, we all love tits, but I want something that I yeah. can sit there with my kids and still going to make me interested in watching it, and but open their minds to what real horror is. And, and I wish there was more filmmakers doing that. Well, they are more about film back then. Nowadays, you know, anybody's got a phone that can make a movie. So it's it's I don't think that they're they're not learned up are taught up enough well enough in filmmaking to be good filmmakers even myself um i'm just learning what i saw well you know even even in your film there's there's a a course in 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 uh circus there's there's stuff i don't want the kids to see right but, but i will not... say this, those aren't real nipples or real bushes they're all Marcus yeah. did the fake nipples and the fake penis and all that stuff. Yeah, <laughs> so. and there's not a ton of nudity. Like, no, like no, you, uh, you pop a corn, that's like a shock value. Um, yeah. You know, you have the girl being chased. <laughs> yeah. From a but, distance. But, but you, didn't, you didn't try to just chalk that. It, and, and tell you the truth, at this age, you know, when I was 12, I'd love to see a bunch yeah, of titties in the movie. Yeah, was great, but I mean, I'm not 12 anymore, so that's what I say, too. And there's yeah, still nothing... filmmakers my age that are, you know, titty this and titty that, but it's like, if that's what you're all you're watching a movie for, buddy, don't watch my movie. No, no we have Pornhub. Why do I need yeah. to watch? Why do you I know, need it? You know, when I was 12 years old, I needed to find some spanking material, but now I don't need that in my horror. And, uh, no, and I'm, I'm, like... I'm not afraid of the female form, and I don't feel like it should i'm not a prude and i'm not going to say it should be cut out but if that's all you've got to right. offer, i know i want to see storytelling mm-hmm. and i think you are a storyteller billy um i i think you're a wonderful showman uh and you know your attention for detail and then how you put together you know uh all your uh your uh, musicians and your concert that, that you conduct in, into the, the film that we see. Um, you know, I, I think you, you do really well. Um, so there, there's more to, I mean, it, it definitely has the extreme moments and has some, you know, adult things in it, but it, it really is storytelling. To yeah. Me. I love and, that. and don't get me wrong. I can't wait to see Mr. Fister. But yeah, oh, I, but, I was but, about, I was but I'm about saying to bring that up earlier. That's when I'm when I do so that, excited. it'll be done in a unique way. It it won't be what you expect, but it'll exceed your expectations. Though that's I know I I, I wrote a story. My wife's into ghost hunting and stuff, and we went to this um old abandoned hotel, and um I can't go with him and climb all these stairs or nothing. So I just hung out at hung hung out at this control uh, center by myself, just writing and wrote a whole movie i may even go out to this place and film it because these people the town was real nice and gave us full access to it but um it would make a good movie so i wrote the whole movie um i guess a couple of months ago when i was out there in this small town in texas is that fister uh-huh mr fister yeah whose fist is it in the the trailer um that's um rusty that's he's mr okay. blister and he's that's mr. what fister. i thought yeah that's how the his name in circus was supposed to be zippo but my attorney kept saying, I'm going to get sued. I'm going to get sued. You need to change the name. And he told our big investors. And then they said, well, you better change the name if that's what he's telling you. So so me just being a dick. <laughs> okay, it's Mr. Blister. So, but it, <laughs> I can't see him being anything else now. <laughs> what was the, um, whose voice was it? And doing the, the narration or the actual yeah, Mr. This is my toy. Oh, that's Rusty. That is oh, Rusty. Really? Yeah, yeah. Now, now, my question: Where did the name Papa Corn come from? Lee come up with that, and I always hated it. Um, but there again, now I can't imagine it being anything else. Um, I was never crazy because it seemed, you know, very kitty friendly or whatever. I didn't get it, but you know, I guess everything happens for a reason, so it stuck, and and I left it in there. Well, I think the juxtaposition between something that sounds, you know, friendly and yes. kind of, you know, yes. uh, cute. You know, whatever. Yeah, with, there ain't nothing cute about them. <laughs> the, the darkness in the mind of, you know, what uh, Bill brings to life in, in that character is, uh, yeah, yeah, that's, that's intense. Now, the, the Jumbo, 
that's just an oxymoron on the whole jumbo yeah. shrimp. Yeah. Jumbo <laughs> shrimp is all that is. A uh, noodle dome. There's a road on the way from in the middle between West Texas and Dallas that says Doodle Dome. So when you drive up to Frightmare, you see this road that says Noodle Dome. Yeah, and and he has a Noodle Dome. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, that yeah. name always stuck in my head. Uh, <laughs> yeah, the, the, the characters in that film film are just just so good. I I do love that film. I I can't tell people. I you know I, I post at least a couple times a year. Like you idiots need to go see this film, and that's that's really just because I have such love for it. Um. You know, uh, uh, Stevens, uh, he, he was a cinematographer on a film that Marcus directed. I think it's some of Marcus's best um, um, best effects work, too. So it, we, it's we just all him, around really good. We put him under the, on the grind on that one. There's a lot of stuff, him and Matt. And Heather Buckley was actually helping, too, back then on that. Um, so, I mean, it took their work around the damn clock. There's a lot to do, and it come up quick in the movie. Well, and and you were saying earlier how how Bill Oberst doesn't even realize what uh <clears throat> you know he, the the kind of cult following it has, and and I I see you joking with uh with Damien back and forth about yeah. art versus <laughs> yeah. versus um <laughs> versus Papa. I'm just Papa. I'm just jumping on their coattails. I'm just trying to get a little bit of their eyes to check it out. Is all um they they did something you know great you know and and there's no movie that's perfect and I know I got some. A lot of issues with my movie. Um, overall, I loved I love Terrifier. I love Art the Clown. Um, I like David a lot. Um, he gets a little political now, but I'm okay with what he's saying. So it, as long as their agenda meets my agenda, it's okay. It's only when somebody differs their opinion is when you have a problem. But uh, <laughs> I hope to work with him someday, too. Well, we're in a world where these films can coexist and they can yeah. have their own fan bases. They can share fan bases. They can be celebrated individually. And um and I, I'm glad that uh, well, such a stick is out there. Right? It's like a stick, and it's. I think people like we have fun with it and stuff like that. And I think they're going to be at, both of them's going to be at Frightmare, and I'm going to try to video um, my meeting with them for the first time. So. Oh really? <laughs> so that might be pretty fun. So and you're I'm still trying to get Oberst. Now, if me and Oberst get to go meet, you know, David and Davy, and that's going to be pretty dang cool. You you occasionally have some cosplayers doing Papa Corn, don't you? Yeah. Um, well, it's, I don't have them doing it. They just. Oh no, that's what I'm saying. You you've yeah, they pop cosplay. up. Yeah, it's pretty yeah. great. Uh, I I dig it, uh, especially the the sexy uh, mama corns that come out of the closet. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, that's that's fun stuff. But uh, the yeah, the last guy at Bastrop. Um, his name's slipping me, and I feel bad about it. But he that dude was dead on, man. That was nuts. But he was watching the movie and. It was like it was Rocky Horror Picture Show. Um, maybe this will be a classic someday, and um, there'll be a hundred popcorn cosplayers all doing the lines during one of the screenings, and then I'll know I can die happily. <laughs> well, that's got it. You know, as as a filmmaker, the seeing somebody walk up as a character that you helped create and put on the screen that's that's just got to be like a great ego boost. <laughs> it, yeah, I, it definitely is cool, and I like them. When they really dig down deep and ask questions that normal people that watch a film don't ask, um, that's cool, too, because there is actually that whole backstory on everything. And for them to ask and stuff it, and to care that much, it does. It means the world. Um, fans mean more to me than money. Um, people laugh, say bullshit, you know, you lying fat fuck. But um, I'm serious, man. It's, it's more about that. I would rather do a movie that everybody loves and a movie that everybody hates and make billions of dollars. Now, um, when, when you were when Bill was taking this part, did you have like a one sheet, some kind of history behind Papa Corn to help him get into the character? How how did that come about? No, we talked about it a lot. Um, but you know, until you get to know somebody, you can only get to know him so much on the phone and stuff. Especially, you know, I was a little scared. You know, he's he's coming in from Hollywood and stuff like that, and you know, I I was a little bit taken back and. That first night we filmed that scene where he cuts the tongue out and I felt like it come off a little Jerry Lewis kind of, <laughs> you know, paging Dr. Noodle. And, you know, I liked it. It was good. But he seen me have a weird look on my face and he approached me after and says, you know, hey, you're the director, Billy. It's what you say goes. He goes, I'm only as good as how you can direct me. Um, and I said, well, I said, well, let's look at pop again. I said, I said, think about like a Jack Torrance or um, Daniel Day Lewis and, and, mm. and uh 
what is that gangs of New York yeah. or even Jack Nicholson and Cuckoo's Nest. I said, that's kind of who Papa is. And then it's like, you just see this whole world open up in Bill's eyes. And he's like, I think he is actually excited because it's like, he ain't playing some cheesy, ha ha, funny, ha ha. Look at me. I'm a clown. You, you gave him something to seek his. Teeth. Yes. Now all of a sudden he goes, this dude ain't a clown. He just happens to be dressed like a clown. And that's when it clicked. And when it clicked, and he started doing what he did. I mean, that's when the hair on my arms raised up, and I knew we we're on to something. But I will say this and go out on a record is, you know, without Bill playing popcorn in this movie, we wouldn't have this. We would, I wouldn't even be on this podcast because that dude knocked a freaking Grand yeah. Slam home run, period. Now, I, I was always curious about uh, the card game. Um, it, it, I, yeah, I, you know, I'm you're in texas so you're you're in golf more around mexican mm-hmm. culture but I, I i would i would go on a limb and say you know i've had you know quite a few mexican friends so i probably know more about mexican culture than most of your gringos um yeah. <laughs> that that are, are up north anyway um well, how did that card game work into it because i i don't know much about the history behind it and i know obviously it's supposed to be a bingo type game mm-hmm. how how did that how does that work into the story what's the background behind that well the, the background behind it is um the hardest part on a movie and the the where where a, a movie let's even say a horror movie but i guess it applies to all movies but uh, where a movie fails is the ending you know an ending can make or break a movie for yeah. a lot of people and i couldn't i didn't have a good ending on this and and my friend john who did all the artwork and stuff is you know, he, he's of hispanic descent he was getting married and uh, they had a wedding party and i was one of his groomsmen and he did these um, grooms, you know, they give them gifts and stuff. Yeah. He did one that was a Mexican theme or border theme. And it had the Loteria cards in it. And it had the, you know, chiclets and some chicharrones and some mini uh, tequila bottles and mini Coronas and a wrestling lucha mask and all this kind of stuff. And it said El Bloody Bill. But the two cards he put into mine were uh, El Diablo or El Diablito, Little Devil, and... Um, uh la muerte the death card and i go i go whoa these are pretty neat what are they tarot cards and that's where that line comes from he goes yeah you're stupid dude it's like bingo from mexico and i go (laughs) oh so basically to play it is like that you would take these dried pinto beans and you'd have a plankard and then they'd call out these things if it was a boat or a chalupa or whatever and um you do it now where we change it is i thought like well a boat doesn't make sense i wanted this to apply to that because i wanted um Popcorn to be the devil and i wanted don to be the death card because he brought death to all these people because of him um so that's where that worked out so i just had to tie it in somewhere uh some of the bad reviews we get is they say we didn't do that good enough so and i can see that well i i loved how they're used at the end um uh, because that reveal at the end is is uh just so bleak and i'm a fan of really bleak stuff and and i think the end kind of ties it together enough for it to, to work for me. Um, but it, it's also, you know, where you're coming from, you, you know, you might, you, you know, you might actually take it for granted that maybe more people know about Mexican culture than people in other parts of the country as well. <laughs> maybe, but I think that, I guess if I would have got everything, if, if this movie was made, if I got to the nineties, let's say, I feel like I got in the lower seventies in my job of doing as a director and producer and all this, if I would have gotten the 90s, I think all that would have been understood better and been better, and I'd have had a better project. That's what I got to do as a filmmaker is get where I feel like I'm in the 90s in my filmmaking, because right now I just feel like Circus was in the 70s. Well, if we can get you into the 90s and that was the 70s, uh, it, <laughs> we'll have a lot of happy fucking people out there. Really. I think so, and that's and that's what I care about. I want people to love that. I want them to talk about these characters. And that's the one thing with Cowboys from Hell is, shit, they're like, Mr. everybody loves Mr. Blister and stuff. There, I, I was telling somebody the other day, there's a dozen Mr. Blisters in Cowboys from Hell. There's people that show up for four or five minutes, you know, and then disappear. They could probably have their own spinoff shows and stuff. There's This might be the most interesting character movie I'll ever do. Yes, and that's that's what really does keep a film interesting is uh, the side characters, and uh, you know the the fact that you feel that there's a story. I feel there's a real story behind each one of those clowns, and uh, yes, I, I is, want yes. I I would like to see more. Like if you uh, you know I I know you kind of uh, 
you maybe tease a little bit about a series or something mm-hmm. uh, coming from this. And that's something I would be fully on board. I, I'd watch a whole hour long episode of how Jumbo became Jumbo. <laughs> well, I don't know. If we'd go back to do backstories. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I think what we'd do is we'd play that series more like uh, Tales from the Crypt or Twilight Zone. I think okay. that it would tie into the circus world and you would get to see maybe Mr. Blister on a regular day somewhere else in life. But um, you'll also get to see doll boy or a Mr. Fister or lady finger killer, all these other things I have wild woman from Borneo. You might get to see a bunch of other different things too, that doesn't even tie into that. Um, I just want to make one series that would be like that. It's just kind of a hodgepodge thing. Uh, back in the old days, I'm, I'm Chinese um, and uh, part Chinese and, chop suey is an old food they used to have in the old days and yeah. it's kind of like i guess menudo uh, for the mexican <laughs> culture where they just kind of throw the kitchen sink in there that's what chop suey was and that's i always wanted to do billy pond's chop suey you know? oh, that's so that awesome. way and it's just so it's just random you know shorts hour-long shorts on you know whatever you know different stories we write and stuff some tie together maybe you got a two or three parter but for the most part they're just standalone hour shorts that that's that's awesome too. I that, you know have the anthology. Well, you know so much stuff is a serial nowadays. Uh-huh, you don't get uh-huh. enough. Uh, you don't you don't get enough where hey I can just sit down for an hour and skip around to which episode I want to watch more at this time. So I, I enjoy that as well. Well, that's funny you say that because I was talking to somebody else about that today. The other day is that you can't for a filmmaker to get somebody's attention for an hour and a half today with all these damn distractions, telephones and this and that. People watch while they're multitasking now. So it's just hard as ever to entertain and to get somebody's attention. So if any filmmaker can do that nowadays, it's, it's a miracle. Yeah. It's, it's amazing how these younger kids, they can't watch a film they without cannot. their phone. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm on Facebook and somebody's like, they're, they're, they're posting. I'm in the middle of this. So, and so yeah, film. like, my what the hell watch. are you fucking, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Why yeah. are you posting? <laughs> If you got time to post this and talk to somebody, you're not paying attention. Yeah, it's not that good of a movie, I guess. <laughs> but they'll be watching classics and saying that. Yeah, you I don't know, get it. it's just it's not my culture. I don't get it. When it's movie time, I need to turn off all distractions and focus. Yeah, it's it's funny. Like my my wife, I drive her crazy with it. Like uh, we we have a fish tank, and the bubble blower is a little loud for my liking. So I go and turn that off. You know, I'm. <laughs> she's like, you know, I'm turning off all the lights, and she's like, why do you have to do this? I'm like, well, we're watching a movie. This is what we do. <laughs> That's it. Get it quiet. And, and especially with me, and I know that David appreciates film, and I'm not saying that he doesn't. By the way, that I. I my appreciation for it is, but I'm really looking at camera movement. I'm looking at editing. I'm looking at rhythm and pacing to to study the the art of assembly. You know, because I, you know, I always have looked at that. But the older I get, I see more stuff that affects my editing, my writing, my filmmaking, and my own cinematography. Yeah, and I, I, I it's got to have. The, the showcase of my attention. Um, so I can see all that. And then sometimes it takes multiple viewings. You know, sometimes I watch a movie mm-hmm, uh, mm-hmm. that I love and I'm watching it specifically for performances. And then sometimes I'm like, no, I really need to look how this is edited together because there's, th- th- there's so much in filmmaking. And some people tell me like, well, how could you watch that movie more than once? Or you watch a movie more than once? I actually have an actor that I cut loose from a uh, feature film that I actually had to scrap after getting, you know, um, a good quarter of it in the can um, because I, I had to replace this part and then time elapsed, time lapsed and it was just, uh, it wasn't salvageable where it was at. Right. But he told me, you know, it, we, we had so many conversations about our love for cinema and taught, we discussed mm-hmm. film and, and what these films meant to us, what it means to the viewers and the audience. And then he told me that he, he won't watch a movie a second time. And I'm like, oh, I don't feel like you've even seen any of these movies. Yeah, yeah. Because there are films that I've seen, um, and, and I'm not a dunce, it's just that they're so complex and there's so many layers to them that I, I'm only getting into that, peeling back that layer of the, the concept, you know, 20 30 years into watching this movie repeatedly every year you know well and 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 you can grow with films you know a film that i watched when i was 18 
I take different meaning from now that I'm in my 40s. We're so all on it, the same page because to me, it's like you need to learn. That's why I watch these indie films and stuff, and some of them, you know, I roll my eyes out at and stuff like that, and I go, how come I can't hear this? Why didn't they mic this person better? But to me, everything's a learning thing. What would you have done different, Billy? On the best movie to the worst movie, I do that to every movie. I learn from it. I try to and, take something from and, it. And my collection uh, on the shelf has – examples of the best cinema ever made and some of the worst cinema ever made and um and of course i celebrate that whole spectrum as long as it's entertaining and that and and can engage me because there's some very you know thrown together you know haphazard films that are in very enjoyable to watch you know mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and and are inspiring in some way to me there's just like something so endearing about you know watching you know these uh you know, weird, you know, films or these Frankenstein's monsters that people have assembled um, that, you know, make me smile because they exist in this world, um, as well as, you know, inspired by, you know, Laurence Olivier's um, uh, Hamlet from 48 or, or whatever, you know. Well, we're talking about uh, pieces of talent. I'm going to watch Found soon. I've heard nothing but good from Found, but uh, recently... I saw a movie that has stuck with me like um, gravy on my ribs. And I think is one of the greatest movies that I've ever seen is the greasy strangler. Like I'm so oh, in love yeah. with that movie. <laughs> I love, love, love that movie. Yeah. That is such a, that's such a amazing film just because the weirdness to it, uh -huh. there's, you, there's nothing like it. And it's that's very, it's the most unique thing I've ever seen. It's up there with uh, midsummer in a completely different way, but up there with midsummer. Yeah, it, it just blew me away the first time that, uh, that I saw, saw it. And um, Michael St. Michael is part of the uh, – he goes – his real name is Michael Rappaport, which mm -hmm. would be really hard if you're an actor to actually go by that name. But yeah. um, it, he's actually in, in uh, the Sadistic Cinema group. And, well, I follow uh, him on his page, but I don't, I don't think he understands how big of a fan I am. I don't yeah. think he understands. He's been really supportive. <laughs> I mean, he's been, sh he's shared a, a lot of my posts and I'm just like Michael Rappaport. I'm like, Oh God, the greasy strangler is sharing my stuff. I was like, this is pretty cool. Well, well at first I thought, I thought we had Michael Rappaport in the group because <laughs> he, he, he did have a picture at one time of the other actor, Michael Rappaport. And I'm looking, I'm like, what the hell? Why is Michael Rappaport in a sadistic cinema group? And, and I love, I love both Michael Rappaport's by the way, but, um, yeah, it, and he's like he's sharing my reviews, and I'm like, and then I find out it's the Greasy Strangler. I'm like, this yeah. is fucking awesome. He, he's on my list. I'm on. I'm gonna work with that guy too. He's good. Uh, I'm gonna work with him. His he was so funny in that film, um, and it's just such a weird funny. But uh, it, it, that that is a really good one. Ha, have either of you seen that director's follow up to that movie? It's on Netflix now. I have not oh, watched it, is. it yet. Okay, yeah. I, I haven't seen it either. Um, I saw it at Walmart, but it was on DVD and when it came out, I guess, and I really wanted to get it on Blu-ray, and then it just got off the radar, and I forgot to, you know, try to. Uh, pick I it. didn't. I didn't know there was one because I haven't kept up that much. Um, so. it, it's got a kind of. Um, it's an eclectic title, if I remember correctly. Yeah, um, I'm looking it up right now. The okay, Jim Hosking, right? I film on Jim Hosking. There we go. Let's go to him. Filmography. Um, An Evening with Beverly Luff Lynn. Right. <laughs> and it's, um, uh, God, what, what's his? Craig Robinson. Yeah, I was going to say it had like a, a, yeah. a big name comedic actor in yeah, the film. Yeah, it's got Craig Robinson from. Um, what hot tub time machine? Yeah, yes. from the office. And yeah, he's in the office. I um, I always liked him in Hot Tub Time Machine because uh, he worked at that dog groomer's called Sup Dog. <laughs> <laughs> I, I love that intro w with him in it. Um, but uh, I, I forgot really what it's about. But he's like some kind of like a celebrity speaker or something. I think, and. And I, it, it gets kind of bizarre from there. I don't know if it's a kidnapping. I'm trying to remember something. I know, I know it was labeled as like a crime comedy film. So, yeah, it's still one I have to check out. I, I don't know why it's taking me so long to see it, to tell you the truth. We'll have to follow up on that one. 
Yeah, the this the plot thing I'm reading has a bunch of spoilers in it, and it's basically like a a, a condensed version of the script. It's not like a log yeah, line yeah, yeah, or anything. Yeah. So I, I I can't really discern something I can say over the air, you know, that makes sense about it. But yeah. I'm just trying to remember the trailer that I saw. But it, it was kind of yeah. There's some kind of crime element. It seems like the the couple that's in it um, end up with that person, like, uh, and it seemed like they were captive or something. And, uh, you know, Craig Robinson, I was sold on Craig Robinson, honestly, because I, I <laughs> he's a, a really funny guy. And, uh, and of course, it's kind of going to be bizarre because it's uh, from, um, you know, the director of The Greasy Strangler. Yeah. But thanks well, for putting the money that, that uh, movie back on my radar. I, I've got it on Blu-ray, but I, I've only seen it once. I need to revisit it. Yeah, now, likewise. Yeah, I think the first time we, we watched that together. So. Yes, we did. We yeah, did. we've watched. It, it means Stephen watching movies is, is an ordeal for other people, I think, around us because we all actually stop in the middle of the movie and discuss what's going on. So <laughs> it takes us three hours to watch. Oh, I know. We, a half we, movie. we don't get to be in the same room very often, you know. Yeah, so yeah. it's a bunch of buddies hanging out. We want to interact with each other, but we also want to respect the film. So when we have that interaction, okay, time out. You know, pause for a minute. <laughs> Yeah. And, and we like have our side for a minute and then we dive back in and give full attention when it's playing. I don't know if that's the best way to do it, but um, I, I don't want to not interact with David. He's a, he's a great friend and I enjoy doing the show and definitely when we can be in the same room, it's wonderful. Yeah. I don't blame you. Yeah. Now, um, so what's in the future for Billy Pond? I, I know with Corona and everything, it's, it's difficult to, uh, <sighs> No scheduling with production and everything, but um, do do you have anything uh, on the horizon? Of course, you have what you what you want to get done, but is, do we have any plans uh, uh, to move forward with production? Yeah, I mean that it's going to happen. I just got to finish up this script where I'm happy with it, and um, we're going to move. And as soon as they lift the restrictions, we're going to go 100 miles an hour. Um, but my goal is to try to get at least a film a year done whenever i'm in this situation or or three films every two years or something i just really want to start making films more often and making that you know instead of waiting five or six years in between um yeah that's what i would like to do well i know i know the the distro side of it and and i don't know why (laughs) it it took so long for you to to find something that benefited you uh i i thought that was such a huge tragedy be- uh, for how long it took you because I see some of these films being picked up and I'm like, but they're not, they're the not. Fuck? Here's the thing is we, we, I got picked up by eight different people. I just didn't accept none of them. And yeah. Yeah. You didn't get the deal you wanted. They're out of, they're out of business now. Um, and the rest of them, I got zero feedback from other directors that have worked with these places. So, you know, once I'd get two or three people saying these guys are crooks, don't go with them. I just didn't send my movie. Um, I wish Dread would have picked us up first go round, but they didn't. But, you know, me staying, you know, um, pimping everything out like I was, I think, it, you know, it was on somebody's radar somewhere. And luckily I took that tragedy of, of indie, indie, uh, what is it gone? Um, no, distributor, no, no, distributor oh. Oh. business is a blessing. You know, other, other filmmakers are pissed and all that. Cause yeah, we got screwed out of some money and stuff, but, I thought, hey, this gets me out of this situation. Maybe I can get a redo. So, yeah. and I reached out to Dread first, and and bang. How how's the relationship been going with them? It's good. I like them a lot. Um, uh, it has. We we've only went out in July, so it hadn't even been three months yet. So I haven't. Yeah. I can't tell you how the movie's doing or anything yet. I, I think it's doing good. I hope it's doing good. Um, but yeah, I don't know for sure. Um, they said they got a lot of good buzz on it. I keep seeing a lot of uh, bad reviews now which kind of makes me happy in the sense of that means people that aren't in my network are watching it. Oh, oh yeah. Good. Well, yeah, I, I checked out the, some of the negative reviews on Amazon and they didn't see a lot of them did not seem realistic. Um, or like, I'm not sure what kind of expectation somebody had going into it. It was, it was kind of weird. Um, yeah, but, but look, at, it, look at what else they're reviewing. And sometimes you see, it's like they're reviewing, Boy Meets World and stuff like that, and you're going, oh, oh, oh. Hannah Montana. Oh, yeah. I go, yeah, they should have been watching this movie. <laughs> well, and and Dread, uh, they just put out. Uh, we recorded with the guys from Uncle Peckerhead, who yes. uh, who uh, 
I love that film. If you haven't had a chance to see I haven't that, seen it I, yet, I really but it is, it's on my two watches. Oh, it's, it's a fun one. It's a fun yeah, one. but Dredd just picked them up as well, and it seems like a and and they did Butt Boy, which I watched, which was pretty Brad funny. Brad Fox was in there. I haven't seen that. Yeah. But. So I think they're doing a really good job of getting some some different, weirder, you know, and fun horror out there. So so I all my well wishes to you because Dread is, you know, it's a name people know. So I just I just hope that they treat you the way that you, you should be treated. But um, I'm glad more people are going to be able to see the film. Yeah, I think they will. I got I got good hopes about them. I think everybody's going to treat me well now because they know the following and stuff. I think it would be bad if somebody didn't. Yeah. <laughs> so, I don't think I'd want to be in those shoes. <laughs> David, have you seen Butt Boy? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I I haven't heard of it um, until I saw that it was selected with um, that movie I'm DP, DP on Bad Girls for uh, Cine Underground uh, Italy. Yeah, it's it's a really uh, strange one. Okay. It's 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 almost bad Milo esque uh, if uh-huh. you remember that one, but it's uh he's more putting stuff in his ass and things coming out. <laughs> oh we, uh, yeah, we were uh, I guess selected with the the mayor, Disco Exorcist, uh, Diablo Rojo, Galaxy Lords, um, Death to Metal, Butt Boy, and uh, I Coke think it's on Shutter. The Ramboner films. Yeah, I think if it, I might be incorrect, uh, but I think it, Butt Boy might be on Shutter. Uh, it, it's streaming somewhere. I, I came across it, but uh, yeah, Dread Dread's getting it out there. So it's I'm surprised that they're still even submitting to festivals. If it's um, you know they already got the distro and everything, but I, I guess if uh, your film's up with something that's already uh, got some distro, it might it, it might help it get more eyes on it too. So that's a good thing. And yeah. it's possible that with the uh, you know COVID and everything, they missed out on a lot of screenings they would have had previously, and you know they're they're just trying to get you know it in a theater again you know for a well, festival. well you know what's cool is I was looking at the, what's out at the theater now. The wife was itching to go this weekend, and uh, there's a lot of the NC-17 and super rated R movies. And I was thinking these would have never got out before. There'd be too many blockbusters that would bump them off the bill. So yeah. that's kind of cool. Um, I knew we weren't going to get into the theater, so I'm just happy to – everybody's stuck at home during COVID. Maybe it did wonders for us. I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm hoping to because yeah, people need to give this film a chance. And, uh, you know, it, when you get a chance to do part two, I'm going to be first in line because I'm going to love to see the continuation. And I'm going to love to see Bill put this makeup back on because, like I said, that it seems like that that role was made for Bill. I agree. I agree. And it's it's like, um, what is that hitting, uh, getting lightning in a bottle? Because yeah. I, I just, I think anytime I work with him, it's going to be lightning in a bottle. And, and I've made so many good friends. Uh, Paris Randall is one of my favorite people in the world. And his character in... Um, Cowboys from Hell is so different from that one, <laughs> you know, so, but this character in here, he's almost like the Mr. Blister. He's kind of a, a smart ass, um, a racist named Butch Jarek as who oh, he okay. plays, but he's, he's really good in there, but he, he, he rolls cigarettes. Just he's, he's obsessed with rolling these cigarettes and smoking them. So it's going to be pretty funny. So, <laughs> so, like so no, pay, no payroll of Zool's in, in this film. <laughs> you know what? We'll see. It might be some tobacco <laughs> pouches. That's a good idea. I'll do a Pedro Zool. Tobacco yeah, it, pouch. It's gonna it's gonna be your red apple. There you go. Yes, we <laughs> forgot to see those in all Billy Pond films. Well, this is awesome. Uh, St- uh, Stephen, anything else you want to run by Billy before we let him go for the evening? No, man. I I think we've been uh, uh, bugging him enough, man. You know, <laughs> I, I know it must be torture to have to tolerate our nonsense for for this long. Uh, yeah, I've been holding back the vomit for a, a while now. <laughs> well, that that that's kind of you, but uh, go ahead, go ahead and vomit. That will get us more <laughs> views. <laughs> well, y'all tell when next time you talk to Michael uh, Rappaport, you tell him. So I'm a fanboy when it comes to that guy. That's like my favorite movie. Yeah, I've been I've been I'm thinking about getting him on the show. Uh, I, I, he's he's it's, it's kind of funny because he he uh, messaged me, but I, I guess he has a handler. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> so you yeah, I have to go through a handler first. Well, of um, course, Big Ronnie has a handler. <laughs> yeah, Ronnie, Big Ronnie I, needs a handler. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, Billy, man, it's it's always great to talk to you, and um, you know, 
it 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 bothered us when you were going through all your cancer and uh i'm i'm glad that uh you're you're feeling better and i know you're still dealing with some complications but um all you know that, all that was good juju you guys and you guys and everybody else around the world you know i think that's what did it and pulled me through because there was days i was ready to check out and it just felt like there was something keeping me around for some reason so i think it was all that good juju and good vibes you guys are sending out and and like we were talking earlier before the show, we you know we we lost a, a close friend in Ryan Nicholson, and and yeah, I know yeah, very he, close. He, he helped you through uh, your ordeal and was a good person to talk really to. Really but... good person, yeah. And we we never got to meet in person at all. Um, and I was telling you guys before we started taping that he he would never talk about himself. He was always fine. I'm doing good. Don't worry about me. That's yeah. what he's always doing. You know, he he always cared about everybody else before he cared about himself. So it just says what kind of person he really was. Well, man, you, you just keep up doing what you're doing. Um, uh, again, folks, if you have not seen Circus of the Dead, uh, first of all, go buy it. Is, 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 is buying it directly from Dread, is that the best benefit to you, Billy? Yeah, I mean, you could buy it there. You could, you know, yeah, I think that's fine. Uh, buy it through them, you know, buy it from uh, the pawn shop. Um, <laughs> I've seen them at garage sales here locally. So oh, awesome. Well, well, you can buy it if, if you're the type that has to watch it first. It is on Prime, and there there are some cuts to the film that uh, uh, is out of the control. You know, that's uh, Jeff Bezos. He's the one who controls all that. So there's a couple cuts. So it, you know, if you got to test it out first, go to that. Then then buy it. This is one you're going to want to have in your collection. Um, yeah, it, it's it's a must. And it, thanks again, Billy, for coming on. Um, anything else that you can plug? You know, websites, anything where where people can uh, learn more about Billy Pond? Uh, yeah, just I have a website. We're trying to get it up and going. We do the promote the haunt there, but I'll have all the movie stuff and everything. We're trying to get everything centralized to uh, bloodybill.com. We should have our big unlaunching here in a couple days. And are you still selling Doll Boy? I am still selling Doll Boy. It's on a, every time I do new printings of it, I switch the cover so that way you don't ever get the same one. So it's on the third cover right now. Okay. And that's that's one, folks. Uh, it, it, it not to stroke uh, Bill's ego anymore. Uh, I love that short. It's uh, I, You know, shorts are really hit or miss with me, and there's not many that will stick with you for a long time. Doll Boy is... You condensed a slasher film into, into a thirty short minutes, yeah, <laughs> yeah, and 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 you, you did such a great job, and you you even built up a really strong character that I would guess that we will see maybe in the future of more. Uh, yeah, he's, bloody he's got a, he's got a huge uh, part in part two, Circus of the Dead part two. Okay, yeah. Oh, so, also, isn't isn't there some um, clown personal pages? Uh, or fan pages like you'd have to things? yeah i don't know you'd have to ask the clowns that one <laughs> so I, I i'm not going to take responsibility for running those things <laughs> yeah i think yeah because yeah, papa corn says some stuff that can get yeah, in trouble i've gotten in trouble by dread once or twice <laughs> <laughs> oh i was going to bring that up that that uh interview that 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 our uh that interview of papa corn and dread was fucking yes. but, at all uh, that had me rolling man. well that was for real fans that actually took the time to read um and i'm glad y'all you did that because i put a lot of uh, or i'm sorry papa put a lot of effort into that yeah I, I, that that i really enjoyed that that article so <laughs> but so thanks a lot billy for coming yeah, guys. to us man um yeah hopefully uh we'll get uh cowboys from hell or or uh, circus of the dead too soon you you are all you have an open invitation to come on and promote and talk with us about the films man thanks man i appreciate it so much you guys well, thanks folks for coming and listening to us again this is sadistic cinema uh you can come over to our S- sadistic cinema community group on facebook that's where we're most active uh we're also at, on twitter a sadistic underscore cinema um check out check us out on youtube look up sadistic cinema on youtube you can see all of our old episodes um and you can like and subscribe and get all the information for uh, the new episodes coming out um so anything else you want to touch on Stephen, before we go no i i I think we uh we gotta give him enough to think about there awesome well 
Thanks, everybody, again for listening. This has been Sadistic Cinema. Have a great evening.